Again, it is good to see everyone out this morning, especially our visitors. This morning we want to begin a study in the book of the, the study of the Beatitudes from the book of Matthew. And as we begin this study, I did not print, I printed off the, the PowerPoint for today, but I didn't print off a sheet. If you will, draw a triangle. And on a triangle, the first three Beatitudes will lead us to the top of the triangle. And then when we get to the fourth Beatitude where Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. That will be at the top of that triangle. And the Beatitudes 5, 6, and 7 will lead us back down the other side of the triangle. I say that to you because the first three of the Beatitudes we're going to study are foundational principles of how it must be for us to be able to hunger and thirst after righteousness. And then the three on the other side of that triangle, or mountain if you want to call it that, they deal with how we are to make application of our hunger and thirsting of righteousness. Story is told of a gentleman who went in to lecture a small class of second and third graders. And as he walked in, he had on a ring, it was his class ring, and it had a stone in the center of it. And he asked the children, to what kingdom does that stone belong? And without hesitation, the children all replied and said, well, that stone belongs to the mineral kingdom. And he thought, that's pretty good. And then he pointed to a flower that was on his lapel. And again, he asked the little children, he said, to which kingdom does that flower belong? And without hesitation, evidently, this teacher that was teaching them had done a really good job. Because they all said that belongs to the plant kingdom. And about the time he finished up with that, a bird flew by outside the window when we had windows in the classrooms. And he said, what kingdom does that bird belong to? And they all, with one accord, said the animal kingdom. You might be thinking, Brother Ray, why didn't you tell us that story? Well, I want to ask you, what kingdom does a Christian belong to? What kingdom do you individually as a Christian, what kingdom do we belong to? And I hope you would all answer that we belong to the Lord's kingdom or God's kingdom. You see, all of us have a place in a kingdom. And so, if I were to ask you this morning, where do you want to be in 10 years? I would venture to say that everyone's answer would be a little bit different. I'm sure that a lot of us would say, well, I hope that I'm still alive in 10 years. Our young children would say, well, I hope maybe within 10 years I'm finished with school. Or those who are in college now, working on their degrees. Or ones who've just graduated. They will say to us, well, I hope for sure that I will be engaged in my field of study and will be able to enjoy a thriving career. And that's a good answer. But as a Christian, where do you want to be in 10 years? Do you want to still be at the same level of knowledge that you're at now? Or do you hope that you are growing year by year by year by year? And what we have recorded beginning in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1 are the very first words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in His earthly ministry. And as you look at these, these words are significant. 
And they are significant because they point out to a vital truth about the new law that is going to come through Christ. And so as he begins with that phrase, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is simply, brethren, in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes. I don't know if you've ever thought of it this way, but as I was preparing for camp in Kentucky a couple of weeks ago, these were some of the topics that I was assigned. The Beatitudes was the, was the assignment. I only got to cover four of them. But the more I looked and the more I studied and prepared for that series of lessons, I began to think to myself, as I read line by line, Jesus is laying the foundation for the church. He's laying the foundation for the kingdom. What he's doing is he's laying the very foundation for all that he wanted to accomplish in his earthly ministry. Jesus says this is how one must live if he wants to be part of the kingdom. And Jesus, after the Sermon on the Mount, began to live his life showing us how these Beatitudes apply. And he showed us how that we might use them in our life. And so when he says in those very first words to be poor in spirit, that's what we want to define this morning. At a lectureship, not too long ago, this quote was made. It says, the door is very low, and only those who kneel down can enter through this door. You might be thinking, well, what does that have to do with the Beatitudes? What does that have to do with our topic at hand? Well, it has everything to do with what we're talking about. Because the lower, let me rephrase that, the poorer we become in spirit, the lower the door can be, and the same for us can still go under that door. You see, our neighbors up the street, they happen to have a cat, and this cat, when you drive down the street, usually is laying in the middle of the hood of their SUV. But I always go by there and I notice they've got the garage door about that far up off of the ground. And I, and I, I, I know why they do that. You know, if it starts raining, the cats don't like water, right? So that cat's not going to lay in the middle of the hood when it's pouring down rain. So they have the door open just high enough so the cat can go underneath and get into shelter. <clears throat> but consider this next statement. This is first. Because it is obviously, as I think or I believe that we will see, it's the key to everything that follows. There is beyond any question a very definite order in the Beatitudes as Jesus teaches them. He doesn't place them in their respective position in some haphazard order or by accident. Remember, every word that Jesus speaks is spoken for a purpose. All that He did in His earthly ministry was done for a purpose. There's reasons why these principles are foundational. And as we go through them over the next several weeks, what you're going to see is, in order to have the next of the Beatitudes, you've got to have the first of the Beatitudes mastered. And so as I go on, what does it mean, Brother Ray, to be poor in spirit? Well, the topic came up last night at our house as we were sitting around eating supper. The question was asked, what are we studying about tomorrow? And I said, well, in Bible class, we're going to talk about, uh, I think I said the Passover, I should have said the, road, the crossing of the Red Sea. And I said, but in the sermon, we're going to talk about being poor in spirit. And 
immediately one or two up around the table says, well, I got that covered because I ain't got nothing. Well, that's not what it means. It's not referring one bit to what many profess it to be. It is not referring to material possessions. As a matter of fact, to take that further, it is not giving advantage to someone who is in, eco in economic poverty. It is not referring to ones who are timid, who are fearful. When I think about what it means to be poor in spirit, I turn over to the book of Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 10, down through verse 12. And I hope you'll commit this particular passage to your memory. Because it is there that two men go into the temple to pray. A Pharisee and a publican. And we know that the Pharisee goes into the best part of the temple grounds. And he begins to pray. You remember the gist of his prayer? He even says, I'm glad that I am not like this publican over here. He's really telling God, look how poor in spirit I am. That's what he's trying to say to God. But was he really poor in spirit? I believe when you read about the publicans, you see the one who was truly poor in spirit. Because the publican in his prayer uttered very few words. Father, forgive me a what? Father, forgive me. I am a sinner. The Pharisee dreamed he was poor in spirit. But the publican exhibited that he was poor in spirit. You see... Fundamentally, as you see in that passage, what being poor in spirit means is that we realize that in our poverty, we are nothing without God. We are hopeless, we are helpless, and all the other words you can think of without God. Being poor in spirit means that you are spiritually bankrupt. That you know without the grace and the mercy and the love of God through Jesus Christ, you know that you are in a lost state. That you have no hope of heaven. In this particular passage of in Luke chapter 18, Jesus illustrates this and he condemns the one who is proud as being unfit for the kingdom of heaven. When we look at ourselves as a Christian, and we say to ourselves, I'm glad I'm better than Carlton Kidder. I'm glad I'm smarter than Carlton Kidder when it comes to knowledge of the Bible. What am I doing? What am I saying about myself when I say those like I'm the Pharisee of Luke chapter 18? But the same Jesus who gave his life on the cross of Calvary for me gave his life for Carlton Cure. Until you and I we, until we will admit that we have no ability to save ourselves. Until we admit that without the knowledge of God's Word and adhering to His Word and His Word only, man will not turn to God. Until I reach the lowest point in my spiritual life, I won't turn to God. In our Bible class on Sunday morning, we're, we're looking at the Israelites as they progress out of the land of Egypt. They're a perfect example of ones who claimed to be poor in spirit, yet when things didn't go quite right, they began to complain. 
they weren't really poor in spirit because they didn't see the desperation until, until they were faced with dire consequences. So only those who Jesus says are poor in spirit are appropriate citizens for God's kingdom. Look at the verse again. Look at what it says. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It says it right there. That ones who are not poor in spirit are not, are not fit for the kingdom of heaven. And those who become poor in spirit are the ones who are teachable. They're the ones who sense their own unworthiness. They're the ones who long for God's forgiving mercy. I have three examples of that on the screen for you. And by the way, I apologize for the print on the paper. I was hoping it would print a dark background with white writing, but it did not. I'll do better next week because all the backgrounds are going to be the same. I'll make sure it prints it right next week. But brethren, I want you to think about a couple of these. We've already talked about the publican. How about the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15? You remember this young man went to the father and he demanded his portion of the inheritance. And the father granted him his portion. And the Bible says that he went away into a far country. And it was there in the far country that he wasted his substance. In riotous, some translations say wasteful, other translations say prodigal living. But you remember, you can turn over and read it, make sure I'm telling you the correct, the correct, telling you correctly. But if I remember what the Bible says, it says that eventually he ran out of money. And the young man, being a Jew, he had to get a job. Oh, how terrible. And it was terrible that he had to get a job because he had no way to support himself. But the job that this Jewish young man had to get was despicable for a Jew. And I'm going to translate it into to, to Ray's translation. This young man had to go and slot the hogs. A nasty, filthy job. When we lived at Falls of Rough, every day, when we went to Litchfield, came past it twice a day, when you, you go on, going to work, coming home from work, there was a cheese factory. They had wonderful cheese. Matter of fact, you, you, may, you may have heard of Baby Bell cheese, you know, the little crumbs and the little red encased. That's what they made at this cheese factory. But every morning, if you got there at just the right time, the old hog farmer would be back in his truck up, and he'd get he'd be filling it up with the leftover byproducts of, of, of the cheese making process. And you just hoped and prayed that you got by there before you had to get behind him and follow him. I'm telling you, hog slop is not the smell of roses. And especially when it slopped out of the top of that tank and landed on your windshield. Why are you telling me that, brother? This young man had to go to the lowest of lows for a Jewish young man. And as one day as he's slopping the hogs, he had the aha moment. He reached spiritual bankruptcy. He became poor in spirit. Because in his mind he realized how much better off the servants that worked for his father had it than he did. And so he said to himself, I'm going to go to my father and I'm going to tell my father I'm not worthy to be called your son. I don't know how many times he rehearsed that speech. 
But brethren, I want you to picture it in your mind. Here's a young man that got to the lowest point in life. He became poor in spirit. And he realized, I know what I've got to do. I've got to be dependent on my father. Again. And so he went home. And his father, on the porch, looking, longing for the sun. He saw him in a distance and he said, could it be? I hope it is. I'm adding to it. As he got a little bit closer, he says, I think it is. And finally, the son got to where the father could see him. And the father didn't stay on the porch, brother. What did the father do? The Bible says that the father ran. And he embraced his long lost son. And before his son could ever utter the words, the father said, get the rain, get a robe, and let's kill the fatty calf. What does that mean? Giving him a rain and a robe says I'm restoring you back to the family. You are not going to be one of my servants. You are my son. You are my family. All of this was done because the young man became poor in spirit. Or how about those on the day of Pentecost? You remember after the sermon was delivered. You know, you all are the ones who put to death the very one who came to save you. Remember the words? Separate yourself from this unborn generation. 3,000 of them that day became poor in spirit. Because the Bible says they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They became spiritually bankrupt. They realized without Christ, without God, that they were nothing. <clears throat> they realized they were hopeless. Brethren, this is fundamental to our conduct as a Christian. What being poor in spirit to me expresses is the very simple fact that I must empty myself of me. Before I can be filled with the traits of Christ. I've got to empty myself of me. How hard is that? How hard is it to say I'm dependent on someone else? Until you and I can empty our heart of evil, it's going to be impossible to fill it with good. Renouncing self has to occur before we can follow God. Jesus in Luke 9 and verse 23, He says, If anyone comes after me, let him take up his cross. Right? What does it mean to take up your cross? That means you're going to empty yourself of yourself and you're going to fill yourself with Christ. Unfortunately, some have been Christians for many, many years, but they never have become poor in spirit. Before you, again, emphasis sake, before you can fill your heart with righteousness, before you can become a citizen in God's kingdom, you must become poor in spirit. You've got to get to the lowest of lows, realizing that without God, without Christ, you can do nothing. You see, the Lord's emphasis is upon those who are humble, those who are wanting to be totally dependent upon Him. What does our world emphasize today? 
What is, does the world that we live in say, well, I, I don't need your help. I, I, I rely on myself self-reliance. Does the world teach self-confidence? Does the world teach self-hope? Yes. Totally the opposite of what God's Word says. The poor in spirit is willing to say to the Lord God Almighty, the song we sing, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. So we're going to close out this morning's lesson. And you've got to look at some of these things that I have on the screen. And this will help you determine whether you're poor in spirit. Oh, and by the way, this attitude of being poor in spirit, it's not a one-time thing. Being poor in spirit goes on and on and on. Because we can never become dependent upon ourselves. We must always be dependent on God. So how may I know when I'm poor in spirit? When I'm weaned from myself. When I realize that I cannot do it for myself. Look what the psalmist writes in Psalm 131. Psalm 131 and in verse 2. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child, my soul within me. Weaned so. Number two, we can be poor in spirit when I am lost in the wonder of Christ. I only want to go to one verse there. I've got three up there, but look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father. Be lost in the wonder of Christ. Someone says, well, I haven't seen Him. Yes, you have. You see Him every day when you open the book and you inquire and you study His Word. You see Christ. You see Christ living out the message that He preached. Number three, I know I can, that I'm poor in spirit. Pay close attention. Now I need to read it slow. I know I'm poor in spirit when I don't complain or murmur. I'm out. I'm, I'm out. I like to complain all the time. You do. Keep your head still. I like to complain all the time. Be honest. Don't y'all like to complain too? Just don't take it to the extreme that the lady who went through the drive-thru at McDonald's, she ordered a cheeseburger. She got her cheeseburger and she pulled away. As she pulled away, she began to open the wrapper. And on her McDonald's cheeseburger, of all things, were those tiny chopped up minced onions. And she said, I, and her, so she said, I told him I didn't want onions. She slams her car in park. She walks right back into the restaurant. She goes to the front counter. She begins to be belligerent in her complaints. You might have read this in the news. She became so belligerent that they had to call the police to come get her out of the restaurant. Because she came violent. I've never done that. I have complained about my food being wrong. That's not 
Is that really what we're talking about here? Or is it about when we complain? Oh man, 6 a.m. is early to get up to go to early service. You know, Bible study at 9.30? I just don't think I need Bible study. Or maybe 5 o'clock tonight someone says, well, you know, I got fed plenty this morning. I, I don't need any more spiritual nutrition. Oh, that's complaining. Murmuring I'm not even going to get into. We might tell you about murmuring's cause of the gospel. That would be included in this too. Uh oh. Phoenix, quit pushing the button down there. That wasn't him. I knew it wasn't him. I knew it wasn't him. He pushed it to get back to the right side. Number four of how I may know if I'm poor in spirit when I see good in others. And behold my own faults. I see good in Sissy Orr, and I realize my weakness, my faults. And for the positive things that she does, I say to myself, I need to be like you. I need to improve myself so that I can do the good things that Sissy's doing. I can put any name in there I want. I can know I'm poor in spirit when I use the very first knee mail. When I get down on my knees and I pray to God. I pray to Him and I spend much time in prayer. You know what was said of Jesus after He instituted the Last Supper? It says they went out to the Mount of Olives, right? And it says that Jesus went to pray as his custom was. And I know I can be poor in spirit when I will accept Christ on his terms. That's poor in spirit. Being dependent upon Christ to save us from our sins. Brethren, you can accept Christ on His terms. He says, if, except you believe that I am He, you will perish in your sins. He also says that we are to repent or to perish. He says, the one who confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. He also says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Those are not Brother Ray's words. Those are the words of Jesus Christ Himself in His earthly teaching. He's telling us those are things you have to do to obtain salvation. Those are the things that you have to do to leave the kingdom of, the, of darkness to enter into the kingdom of light. This morning we may have one here that's not done that. And you are willing to become poor in spirit. To accept those terms. To be added to the Lord's church. But Jesus. In the Beatitudes. He also tells us that we need to live a faithful life after we're part of His kingdom. Maybe one here this morning that has been, become a Christian, but you began to think more highly of yourself than you should. And you need to be poor in spirit this morning, repenting and confessing of sin. Whatever your need is, we're here to assist you. Whether we need to baptize you into Christ or whether we need to pray for you and with you.
Whatever your need is, only you know. Our prayers you come while we sing. And while we sing.